everyone. It's so good to have you today. Welcome to Recovery in Action. And we are here today with Amy Hicks, a very good friend of mine. And now she is actually helping me at the House of Ruth. And we're going to kind of go over her story today. But first, I just want to welcome you and let you know that uh, in the community, there is many things going on for recovery. And uh, in saying that, the, there's meetings. Uh, Monday night, they have better days. And that's at 6 o'clock for the meal. And 6.30 starts the meeting. And that is at the Methodist Church in the basement there on 8th and Central Avenue. And then on Tuesday night, uh, they have Brianna's Hope out at Cross Point Biker Church. And it's the same way. 6 o'clock is the mill. 6.30 is the meeting. And that is an NA meeting. And Wednesday night, um, of course, our local churches have church, uh, the ones that are open now for church. And then we have uh, an AA meeting at the Baptist Church by Eastview School. And that starts, I think, at 7.30 on Wednesday. And then Thursday evening, they have, um, what is the meeting on Thursday, Amy? Is it? It's an it's a AA also. Yes, it's AA also, at, yes. Uh, and that's, yes. that's at 7 o'clock at the Eastview uh, Church, the Baptist Church there by Eastview School. And then Friday night, they have an NA meeting at the same place at Eastview Baptist Church, and that is at 8 o'clock. And Saturday evenings, they have Brianna's Hope, and that's at the Methodist Church again on 8th and Central. And that the meal starts at 6, and the meeting starts at 6.30. And um, on Sundays, we encourage everyone to, to find a place of worship, Sunday morning and Sunday night. And anyone uh, that is struggling right now, we just want you to know that there is hope. There is hope uh, when you're struggling and you are thinking that no one cares. Trust me, people do care. And we're doing everything we can in the community to help you, to encourage you, and to support you in any way that we can. And I wanted to remind you that on Monday evenings at 7 p.m., there's an anxiety meeting for people that struggling with anxiety at... Um, it's the, the church on Erie Avenue, uh, Community Gospel, and Linda Long, is uh, she leads that meeting, and she's great. It's a faith-based uh, meeting group, and it's about anxiety. And in, in today's society, with everything that's going on, I mean, anxiety and stress is, a, is pretty prevalent in, in a lot of people today, and we're... People are concerned about their children going back to school. They're concerned about going back to work because people have been living in, you know, working and living in their home. And, and so there's a lot that we've had to contend with since March. And we're just encouraging people to know that there is support and there are groups that uh, we really, we're, we're trying to help you and encourage any way that we can. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome Amy Hicks. Thank Hello, you. Hello, Amy. Hi. Thank you for being here. We work together every day, <laughs> so, so we, we know everything about each other, so it's kind of one of those things. I told her, I said, I just want you to come on and just share, you know, what God has done for you, how the program has helped her, because this is a genuine story of how someone that was very hopeless came into a program you know put god the center of their life wanted help wanted to live a different life and now she is just doing awesome i she's just excelling in everything that she does so tell us a little bit about yourself amy uh, i don't know how far back you want to go but just tell <laughs> us a little bit of of your okay. story well, I grew up on a farm outside Greensburg. I was in the middle of five girls and um, went to church all my life. Um, I was baptized at 10 years old. Um, and then at 
when I was 18, I moved to Bloomington. I went to college and worked full time and then ended up staying in Bloomington for 15 years. While I was in college, when I was 20, on my 20th birthday, trying to juggle classes and working full time and everything, um, that's at the point where someone offered me a line of meth and said, this will help you get through the night, help you study longer. And that was my first experience um, with drugs. And I continued that off and on for years and went in spurts back and forth and wasn't really heavy into my addiction, didn't realize I had a problem. Right. And I, after 15 years in Bloomington, I got married, moved to Martinsville and continued off and on with the drugs. I had a son um, who's 19 now and um, um, who I miss very much. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I got divorced and I moved back to Greensburg and that's when my drug addiction really kicked in. I was trying to work two or three jobs and raising him and I just remembered having that speed and that effect of that that drug and thinking this is what I need again and ran into some friends and they're like, here, this can help you out. And um, it took control of my life. It totally took control of my life. And um, you know, in saying that and not to interrupt you, but how many people do that to get by? Yes. And you that's know, what I thought. I yeah. thought I was getting by. I thought you I was, didn't even realize it was a problem. Absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. I just thought it was helping me out. And I was getting everything done and, I mean, hiding it from everybody and not thinking anybody knew. And, um, you know, the worst thing about it was the people I hurt. Yeah. I never, during my addiction, never even dreamed I was hurting anybody. Yeah. I thought I was helping everybody. And yeah. the hurt I caused for my son and my mom, my whole family, and the, um, throughout my addiction, I didn't even realize it at the time. And, you know, I... <laughs> I was just thanking God that I was arrested um, on my, spent my 50th birthday in, in jail. And, you know, after many prayers and, and studying, it's like I was baptized at 10. I spent the 50th, my 50th birthday in jail. It's like I How spent does four, that happen? <laughs> 40 years in that wilderness. Yeah. That could have been an 11 day trip, <laughs> you know, 40 yes. years it took me. I mean, I wasn't in an addiction that long, but just before I got it, you know, and just realized but. No, back to where I was in my addiction until my last few years, I didn't really, when I wanted to quit, how I'd done throughout the years, done a little bit here and there, realized I couldn't. Yeah. I was doing so much and working so much and just, you know, I um, lived out in the country and had things to maintain and it's like, I couldn't stop my life on a dime. I could not, I wanted to, I was to the point where I was so tired and just I just couldn't stop I just had to keep going and and it actually took me being arrested as yeah. I know everybody's different on different some people can just quit but on me it actually took me being arrested yeah. to quit do you think it's it's too I mean you you become overwhelmed absolutely you know and, and it becomes such a lifestyle that you know you you know that you need to quit and you yes. know that things are you can feel it going in a downhill spiral yes but but just like you, you don't know, it's like, what do I do? This is where I'm at. This is what I have to do. And not that I'm justifying mm -hmm. it by no means, no. but I'm just, but you get to a point, like you said, now what? And I just kept taking on more and more and trying to please everybody, including myself, but trying to please everybody and not saying no to anything. That was my mm -hmm. biggest thing is trying to please everybody and just take on more and more. And, um, you know, that's the biggest thing of my recovery I found out was no is a complete sentence yes. and it's respected. It may disappoint some people at times and I hate to do that, but after, after the disappointment goes away, then they respect that. Um, just, and I catch myself now even doing that, you know, saying yes to everything and then getting overwhelmed. just like, I can't do this. Right. I can't do this it's all. It's too much. It's too much. Nobody can do everything, you know, and I just... I've done that throughout my life, trying to please a lot of people and um, and end up just disappointing them majorly. Yeah. Not just yeah. that little disappointment and that respect right. of no, but. Well, you've learned your boundaries. Absolutely. You, learned, you have learned what you can do. And not saying this because you're getting old, but I mean, <laughs> as you get older, I think the wisdom, you, you learn that. I'm the same way. Used to, you know, I, I was such a people pleaser. You know, I'd be like, whatever I can do, you know, just let me know, just let me know. What can I do? 
I can't do that anymore. I, I, I am, I have what God has called me to do, the house of Ruth, and that's what I do. And, and I had Pastor Richie Ware tell me this one time, and I have thought about this so often. Sharon, you can get into so many things that you want to do that the things that you were called to do, you can't do it well because yes. you have too much on your plate. Yes. And I have, I have learned from that, that that has been tremendous in helping me. And I know mm -hmm. that that's kind of where you were too. Absolutely. Doing everything halfway, just enough yeah. to get by, just enough to please them just a little bit. And then, then it does, the work doubles up and you have more than you have to do. And it could yeah. have just been a simple, like I said, 40 years and 11 day trip. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, I've seen that. Um, so I was definitely blessed um, when I was in jail. My bond reduction was to a rehab and um, all the rehabs were, you know, two or three weeks or a couple months, 30 days. And but they all had these long waiting lists. And by the grace of God, there was just happened to be an opening at the House of Ruth and when my sponsor said it's an 18 month program, I'm like, are you serious? I want, <laughs> I want two weeks and out of here. Yeah. I, I got this, yeah. I got this. And it was gonna be months before I could get into them. And I know this was all God's planning, absolutely was that um, I was able to come to the house of Ruth. Yeah. You know, I, the, um, you know, Matthew it says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be open. And, yeah. you know, I asked God for that help and seeked out a place, and it was the House of Ruth, and then knocking on that door for that first time, and all those doors that you've answered, just, it's just amazing, it's just God. I mean, there's no yeah. other explanation for that. And to be able to come to the House of Ruth and, and learn my boundaries, I mean, that's where I learned, learned new skills, new mindset, as you mm -hmm. always say, you know, yeah. retrained my brain, and yeah. it was just, an amazing program and it works. It absolutely works. I'm living proof that it works. And um, after being at the House of Ruth um, for 14 months, I was sentenced and uh, my sentence was to 10 years in prison. And after doing everything, I felt like I was doing everything right. And I was, when I got sentenced, it was kind of a shock to everybody. Oh, it devastated me. I was so <laughs> shocked, yeah. Because, um, yeah. I mean, I just, I just thought I was doing everything right. But, and at the time, I was so mad at God. I, I just couldn't understand why he was doing that to me. And um, it took me a long time after going into prison, it, going through intake, and just the unexpected through it all and not having my support there or anything. And just trying to figure out why I was there. I just couldn't understand my purpose. And... I just saw in the news the other day about the heat at um, IWP, and I had a personal experience with that. I, you have to tell that story. <laughs> you have to tell it. I thank God now that I had that experience. <laughs> yeah. There's no air conditioning there, and it is, it's almost inhumane, the heat there. And you're in this small room with three people and this big of a window. And, I mean, I remember at night going down to that window just to catch my breath. And it was a different kind of hot. I mean, I've bailed hay before. I mean, I've been hot before, and it's just, you were a farm girl. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I know what hot is. You know, I've cut wood. I've, you know, everything. So I know what hot wood hot is. But it was such a different kind of hot. The sweat pouring off of you just felt like bugs crawling on you. It was such a heavy sweat. And I just remember on September 9th at eight thirty-seven. You've been there about five months. Yeah. Yeah. Was it? I, <laughs> that's what you had yeah, told me. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so I was on my knees praying, and I know it was September. It was September seventh at eight thirty-seven in the morning, and I was on my knees praying, and I was just like, God, I just, I just, I, did, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know anything going on here. I just, I'm just, I was just done. I was just totally, totally done, and. It was amazing because I thought I had surrendered everything to him when I was at the house of Ruth and got my relationship closer with God there. And I really thought I had it and didn't know that I didn't until I was on my knees praying and just praying. I was just like, I was done. I was ready just to be done with life. And I just heard this voice saying, daughter, I am with you. I mean, just, just heard that. And 
it just wasn't hot anymore. It just, I just got up and I just surrendered everything to God at that time. And then within a couple of weeks, I was able to go into a faith-based program there, which was an amazing program. It's called the Plus Program. Because at first they turned you down, didn't they? Oh, it was a struggle. I kept, yeah, yeah I kept getting struggled. They got me mixed up with somebody else's name and I fell through the cracks and I wasn't aggressive enough or I just real passive on everything, just hitting the corner type thing and just let things go and just, you know, I was facing 10 years. It's like, you know, what, you know, why be aggressive in here? This is at least the last place you want to be aggressive. And so after that, I started getting the nerve up to go say, hey, what's going on? I need in this program and getting the paperwork filed and finding out what was going on. And um, again, by the grace of God, again, he um, allowed me to go into this program and this faith-based program was just amazing. It was, I call it the House of Ruth on steroids <laughs> because it was everything that the House of Ruth taught me, but then 10 times as strict, 10 times as, mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was very hard to succeed in that program. So many people don't. And it was just, I just took it by the horns and just did everything I could, even stuff outside that program. I, um, did a lot of community service hours. You had to do 20 hours a month, and I was doing two and 300 hours a month just volunteering to just stay busy. Just, just to stay yeah. busy, and I was doing self-help books and helping with the counselors and everything, and I ended up graduating that program with honors and um, was able, to, I filed for modification, and after two years, I went before the judge, and when I went to county jail, I had no one. I had burnt my bridges. I had no one to even call. And when I went to my modification, that that um, courtroom was full. It was just <laughs> amazing when I walked in there yeah. and saw everybody. And the support I had, um, especially from the House of Ruth, from my church, Clarksburg Church, um, that I went to all my life. It was just amazing. The group of people, you know, it was just Definitely felt God's love in that room. If you mm -hmm. didn't, there's something wrong with you because mm -hmm. it was just amazing. And, you know, I told my story to the judge of everything I'd accomplished and, you know, and surrendering myself to God. And I sat there in shackles and chains. And I'm sure you remember this point, oh, too. Yeah. And I just told that judge, you know, I said, I'm sitting here in shackles and chains and I'm freer than I've ever been in my life. Yeah. And I really was at that point. And. You know, I prayed and prayed if I got that modification and what I was going to do. And it was just on my heart to get back to the house of Ruth. Mm -hmm. No matter what, I just, I would never be able to give back what the house of Ruth did for me. I, and, and you. I, don't, I mean, it doesn't matter what I would ever do. I mean, I could retire from there and it still, <laughs> <laughs> it, it still wouldn't give what it did to me in that yeah. point in my life. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine my life without it. Yeah. And, you know, anything I talk about with the new girls there and stuff is everything I refer to is things I did at the House of Ruth, mm -hmm. the fun times and, and the bad times, oh, I mean, yeah. struggles yeah. and just yeah. what classes we took and just, I mean, I never would have sold honeydew melons along the <laughs> road if I would have been at the oh, House of Ruth. Oh, my gosh. If people, if people could know everything that happens at the House of Ruth, it's crazy. Yeah, that semi of honeydew melons, that they came up and said, we can't use these. Do you want to sell them? And it's like, oh, okay. Oh, right, we got fundraiser. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just the fun times and uh, fun events that we go to, it's just amazing. And I want to be back part of that and, and give back to that and give it to mm -hmm. the other girls and let them, let them get what I got out of that. Yeah. It's just, you know, you, like you always said, you give us the tools, you give us the skills and it's what we do with it. Yeah. It's what we do with it, whether we grasp onto it and go. And I can tell you a hundred percent, I did that. I got a hold of everything that was yeah. offered there and then some, and just, that's what helped me get through my prison state was just continuing that, continuing all that stuff that I learned mm -hmm. at the House of Ruth and just mm -hmm. putting that into action there. Yeah. You know, I lived, it was just me and my son that lived together and, and then I lived alone for a while and then to come to the House of Ruth to, with 14 girls there was just, I thought that was <laughs> overwhelming. And then I go yeah. to prison with 600. So I definitely see God's path this whole way, yeah. God's plan. You know, even though I'm not, I wasn't on his 
path that whole way, but he turned everything I did yeah. into something good. Yeah. You know? And look what now the girls, how they look up to you, and they're like, wow, if Amy can do it, you know, <laughs> a girl that you took to court this morning. Yes. I mean, she got five years, three years suspended, two years on probation. Absolutely. And, you know, to finish the House of Ruth. And she's like, I, I don't want to leave. You know, I've <laughs> right. got, you know, because it is, it's a safe place. It's a, it's a place where real life happens Absolutely. on life's terms. And we deal with it clean and sober. Yes. Now, and I know you're being modest here, but tell, tell them about the... The thing that you did that's never been done in, oh, a, in a prison. Marathon. Yeah, the Bible marathon. So I was at a, at a class called Bridges to Life, and we had outside mentors come into the prison and help with that. And Sharon Whitaker was my leader, and she was telling me she wasn't going to be there for a couple of weeks. She was going to the Bible reading marathon in Washington, D.C. And she was gone for a couple of weeks. She came back, and I was just like, what was this? And I've heard people say God led them to do something. And I've, I'm sure a lot of people have just rolled their eyes, you know, mm -hmm. and I have too. It's like, yeah, right, God led you to do this. But there's no doubt in my mind, there's no way this couldn't have happened without God. I asked her about it. She started telling me about it, about this Bible reading marathon, that it took 300 people, 90 hours on the U.S. Capitol steps to read through the Bible from beginning to end. So I started this project. It took me a year, and there was so many, so much red tape. It was unbelievable on trying to get this together. There was just one thing after another that was happening, and it had to be God-led through this whole thing. And um, I tried to do the whole Bible, and they said I couldn't do that because it would take too much, too much of the, too many people, and too much, um, and nonstop, and at nights being on lockdown and stuff. Right. And there was one time when. I asked the captain of security there how we could do this from dorm to dorm and could security officers call this um, this dorm and the custody officer called this dorm and he thought I was doing a group demonstration and wanted to take me to lock. I mean, I'm serious. <laughs> it was, it was, and I just yeah. threw this folder down. I'm like, I'm not doing this. Never mind. Forget this. I don't need to do this. This is just something extra. I was trying to occupy my time. And guy kept saying, get me out of that drawer and just, you know, like I went to one class and it was on relationships and this lady was teaching and her husband happened to come in. These were outside people. He worked at downtown IDOC and he came in to see, see her and he introduced himself as the director of religious services for IDOC. And it was time to go, to, time to go back to our dorms and I told my bunkie, I said, I wonder if he could tell me if a Bible marathon has ever happened in a prison in Indiana prisons, and she's like, it's time to go back. We don't have time for that. And I just heard God's voice again saying, you don't have time for me? That's what's got you here, yeah. you know? And so I just took that chance, just took those extra leaps of faith, absolutely leaps of faith, and went and talked to him. He said, no, none's, none's been held in Indiana prison. And I had been co trying to correspond with the director at the Bible Marathon in Washington, D.C., to see how they did this, how, how did they implement this, and... I hadn't heard anything back from him, and he said that one had never been held in a prison in Indiana. And I said, okay, I said, can you put that in writing? He said, yeah, write me. And so I said, okay, so I go back, and it took me like a week to find his address. As I'm writing this, I get this email from Joe Bavar, who is one of the coordinators of the U.S. Bible, the National Bible Marathon in Washington, D.C., and he said that one has never been held in the United States, in any prison in the United States. Oh, wow. So I start working on this and working on this and about gave up and because it just wasn't happening. The warden came looking for me and said, what are you trying to organize here? Because they <laughs> knew it would be press releases and that kind of right. thing about it. And, you know, it's just being in that environment, you just don't want that <laughs> publicity. Right. So I about gave up on it. And then I received this really nice Bible from Joe Bavar from the National Bible Marathon and I had been planning this Bible marathon and planning this closing ceremony. I was going to have people sing at it and everything. I had this all planned out in my head, well, on paper, really written out. And it wasn't going to work. So I got this Bible from them, and I, in the beginning of it, talked about the Bible marathon in Washington, D.C. And it said that this doctor started it 35 years ago, and he said the sole purpose on it, he said that the Bible take precedence over the whole event. 
And as I got in this planning of this reading the Bible, I got distracted and started doing this closing ceremony, making that way bigger than actually reading than that Bible. Than the actual the Bible, yeah. So when I received that Bible, I, went, I, well, I started crying when I received that Bible, and everybody's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, this isn't going to happen. Because I knew my modification date was within a month. And they're like, we'll start reading right now. And I'm like, no, we can't do it. It has to be organized. It has to be fail-proof, everything. So... Anyway, so I was upset, and I went to my room, I started reading the Bible, and I see where he says the Bible takes precedence. I'm like, okay, God. I go back out there, and I fill out a new um, um, proposal to the um, program director, and I said, I just want to teach a class. It's for 24 hours. We're reading the Bible. And they signed it right away. And so on February 14th, of all days, <laughs> so in God's love, we started at noon on Friday, and we finished about 11 o'clock. We end up just doing the New Testament and doing it within that plus storm. I forgot about that. We downsized because the Bible took so many people. I, I'm kind of jumping around here. Sorry. Um, that it took so many people that it wasn't going to be done. And so that's another time when God spoke to me about downsizing the Bible. And I'm like, how do you do that? And he's like, I already did it for you, the New and Old Testament. So I figured out there was 11, 1,189 chapters in the Bible. It takes four minutes and 16 seconds to read a chapter. There's 270 chapters in the New Testament. So we could do this in about 22 hours. So that's why I downsized it down to that plus storm for us to make it more it feasible for us to hours, do it. Yeah. And um, so we completed it in um, 21 and a half hours. And we had staff members. We had officers read in it. And the women, it was just unbelievable. There's 66 on my dorm and 58 of them participated in it. And it was just so much peace in that dorm that just, it was amazing that people had never read the Bible before. Yeah. Had never even heard. And how many people gave their heart to the There were 17 people that came up to me during it and afterwards and said, you know, I had this one girl. She's like, I've never, I've heard stories about Jesus, but I thought it was just a bad name that you used. He's like, she's like, and she was really legitimate. She had never heard the stories about Jesus yeah. in the Bible. Yeah. And she's like, tell me more about him. She said, I listened to them. She goes, I've laughed. I cried about the stories. She's like, tell me more about them. And to sit down with these in, in prison with these innocent people that didn't know about God was just amazing. Oh, and, absolutely. And the letters just poured into me afterwards of everybody's just testimonies about how, where they read in the Bible. Everybody's on, everybody's on time slots, not a specific place they read. And they just how personalized each of those time slots and God's timing on all that for who to read what. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had... All kinds of people. We had a lot of. We had some Muslims come in and read with us. We had people from some Catholics come in. All different denominations came yeah. in, and we all just joined together for one yeah. reason. It was just yeah. an amazing feeling. And I know they. Um, it was just recently on the news where they were talking about that at the National Bible Marathon about me doing that. And yeah. I never dreamed how much it would get. How the much the impact. Yeah. I'm still getting letters. Yeah. The, some of the letters we just got yeah. with some of the girls were like yeah. saying, you know, I just it was just amazing that they'll never remember Valentine's Day any different from reading that yeah. Bible Marathon. Yeah. So that was just. You know, I look there at okay, I see God's purpose now. I see it. You know, we can't always see that forward but yeah. you know you can always look back and see yeah. you know if I wouldn't have been there if I wouldn't have got sentenced to that they never would have knew yeah. God they and never would have and that's the thing that we're stressing today you may be struggling but there's always hope absolutely there's always there hope. is and and just like Amy I mean looking at 10 years and then look how God just transformed her life and, you know, there's one person that I really feel like that we need to mention here, and that's Sharon Plemons, because yes. she was such a support oh to you. Yes, and And Absolutely. we just, you know, we love Sharon. She teaches yes. a class at the House of Ruth, and she's been so faithful to us. And, and I just hope this has encouraged you today, because Amy has such an outstanding story. And now she's working hand-in-hand -hand with me. She's the program director at the House of Ruth, and she's available uh, for visits, she can, you know, you can call her, she can encourage you, she can offer, you know, assistance, guidance, resources, because she is, uh, she's a great help, I know that. And so we want to thank you for joining us today, and we, we just wish you the best, and God bless you.